Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Uh, welcome to episode, I think it's 92 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, this is for the last week of January 2013, and uh, I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. For the next almost half hour, I'm going to be your renter and raconteur, talking about things important to me I think are worthy of your attention. Uh, if you have any reactions to the show, anything I say or don't say or whatever, you can email me directly. It's whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Uh, and um, if you do email me, which I invite you to do, I have one request, which is that you include in the subject line something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something so I know it's not spam. And to be a little patient because I do answer my mail. I really do. I'm sometimes a little slow about it, so, but you will get an answer. All right, with that, we're going to head right in. I'm going to first do something, a little feel-good news, little ways to kind of get us off on a good feeling. This is our Hero Award. Uh, this is given as the occasion arises for somebody who just does the right thing. Now, you may know about this one. It sort of went kind of viral, uh, but uh, it's still it's, it's a feel-good story. It's, it's worthy uh, of repeating. Our hero in this case, his name is Ivan Fernandez Anaya. He's a Spanish cross-country runner. In fact, experts in, in Spain say he's like one step away from joining the elite among Spanish long-distance runners. His goal this year is to, at the very least, make the Spanish national team to compete in the European Championships. Well, on December 2nd, he was competing in a race in uh, Berlada, Navarra in Spain. He was running second to a man named uh, Abel Mutai. He's a Kenyan who actually won a bronze medal uh, at, the, at the London Olympics. And the race was almost over. The gap between them was too big um, that uh, Anaya knew he couldn't catch up. And then Mutai stopped running. For some reason, he thought the finish line was actually 10 or 20 meters, which is a little more than 10 or 20 yards, short of where it actually was. Now, according to Anaya, um, Mutai looked back and saw the people gesturing him to keep going, but he didn't speak Spanish, so he didn't know what they were saying. Now, Anaya could have charged right past him and win the race. Instead, in a moment that shows that winning isn't always the most important thing, he actually slowed down and by gesturing to him actually guided Mutai to the finish line and victory. And what's even better about that cool thing to do is that Anai apparently didn't think much about it. He said, I'm quoting him here, I didn't deserve to win it. I did what I had to do. He was the rightful winner. He created a gap that I couldn't have closed if he hadn't made that mistake. As soon as I saw he was stopping, I knew I was not going to pass him. And he said he would have done the same thing even if a place on the Spanish national team for the European Championships was at stake. Now his coach, whose name is Martin Fizz, he, he was not happy with him. He said, I'm quoting him, the gesture has made him a better person but not a better athlete. He's wasted an occasion. Winning always makes you more of an athlete. You have to go out to win. Um, that may be so. And Anaya actually admitted that if something like uh, a world or European medal was at stake, that, yeah, he probably would have just gone, on, gone ahead and taken advantage and won. But the fact is, at this point, he was faced with a choice between being a better athlete and a better person. And uh, Ivan Fernandez, uh, Anaya, he made the right choice. And for that, he is a hero. All right, we're well, moving on from there with uh, a, a bit of good news. Once again, let's, let's get some good news here. You know those, those airport scanners, uh, the ones that uh, with the revealing body images, the one people are calling strip scanners? They're going away. The Transportation Security Administration says they will all be gone by June. The idea of these scanners was that by using them that the security personnel could, uh, could detect objects including metallic ones like guns and, and, and non-metallic ones like plastic explosives, for example. The problem with them was is that they also revealed everything else that you normally want to keep secret. In the wake of persistent large-scale protests by the flying public and uh, a number of occasions where particularly female passengers were told things like, well, one was told that she had to be scanned multiple times because she had a cute figure. 
Um, finally, the feds told the two companies providing these machines that they had to fix this. Now, one of them was able to adjust their software so that what's displayed is just a generic outline. Um, those machines are staying. The other one couldn't fix it. They're going. Those machines are going. So it's one small victory for privacy, which unfortunately the overall record on that particular issue was still well into the loss column, and that's something we'll have to spend more time on soon. But any event, for the moment, yeah, one nice little victory. All right, we're going to move on from there to our regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. On January 16th, the Federal Reserve Board announced a settlement with Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, uh, those companies, to settle claims of wrongful foreclosure and other forms of mistreatment uh, and illegality uh, that were inflicted on homeowners. The deal is similar to one reached a week before with 10 other major lenders. Those were the Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, MetLife Bank, PNC Financial Services, Sovereign Bank, SunTrust, U.S. Bank, and Aurora. Now, Goldman Sachs and, uh, and Morgan Stanley will together put up $232 million in direct payments to eligible homeowners. Uh, and $325 million in other assistance such as loan modifications. That's a total of $557 million. For all 12 banks together, it's $3.5 billion in ca cash compensation and $5.5 billion in forms of assistance. That's $9 billion. Which may seem like a lot of money. And it is. But not to these people. You know that $557 million that Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley together are to put up to compensate people for what they did to them? Morgan Stanley made $507 million in profits in the fourth quarter of 2012. And as for, as for Goldman Sachs, okay, in 2012 it had profits for the year of $7.3 billion, which means it alone could cover almost the entire cost of this settlement paid by all 12 banks together with just one year's profit. Remember, that's not gross income, that's not uh, sales or anything, that's profit. I mean, this is nothing but a slap on the wrist, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, especially in light of the fact that the banks are going to be able to write off huge potential losses because of this. And in fact, it's not even a slap on the wrist. It's not even a slap on the wrist. Now when you consider that this is compensation for hundreds of thousands of people who had their homes wrongfully taken from them by illegal actions by the banks, um, and millions more who are dealing with delinquency notices and other forms of trouble because of those same failures and illegalities. In fact, some four million homeowners, or, or borrowers I should say, are covered by this agreement. With a $9 billion fund, that, that's an average payout of $2,250 as compensation for having your home wrongfully taken from you. Now, to be as fair as I possibly can with this, there's actually a range of figures for the settlement, um, depending upon, to put it bluntly, exactly in what way the bank screwed you. The top figure is $125,000, uh, down to a few people, some people will get just a few hundred. All right, bear in mind, bear this in mind. According to the National Association of Realtors, the cheapest region of the United States in terms of house prices over the last 12 months was the Midwest, with a median house figure of $142,000 at the end of 2012. In the South, it was $157,000. In the Northeast, $233,000. In the West, $248,000. Okay, what this means is that it's possible, it's possible that if you had a very modest home in the cheapest section of the country for housing, you hypothetically might be able to get compensation that approaches the economic value, not the emotional or personal value, but the economic value of what was taken from you. But what's far more likely is that after having your home stripped away from you as the result of the illegal behavior of these banks, your compensation will be a check for a few thousand dollars and a shrug. In fact, if that's not outrageous enough, you want to go one more round? Let's go one more round on this. This is what, to use a great old expression, caps the climax. 
All that money that's going to borrowers as compensation for what the banks did to them, all that money that's supposed compensation for all the wrongs the bank committed, up to, for, for two-timing you, deceiving you, even for taking your house, the IRS regards that money as a cost incurred in the course of doing business. That's right. These, this money is tax deductible. This is, this is not, this, not only is this not a slap on the wrist, this, this is a kiss of the ring of the banks. And it is an outrage. All right, one last thing before we take a break. This is a quick reality check for any libertarian types out there. This house pictured, uh, this is in Pelham Bay. It's in the Pelham Bay neighborhood in the Bronx in New York City. Just 12 inches from their house, as you can see, is the beginnings of a four-story apartment complex. The structure has been built so close to their house that they can literally, the, the owners of the house, their, name, their names are Fernando and Pandy Justiniano, they're able to reach out of their kitchen window and touch the wall of this apartment building, cinder block wall. This is the window that used to look out on a grassy yard. Now, according to Fernando, the developer of the apartment complex initially told neighbors that he was going to build a little home for his mother on this 50 by 100 foot lot. But Patty did some digging and discovered that the actual plan was for an eight story uh, apartment complex with 16 apartments. It's since been cut back to a four story building with 14 apartments. The thing is that Justinianos say that the building is so close to their house that their windows in that whole side of the house, and there were 10 of them, have been rendered useless. There is, uh, it, they're just inches from a cinder block wall. There's no light that gets into their, to their dining room now. Um, furthermore, the structure, this apartment complex, is so close that the Justinianos can no longer maintain or clean the gutters on that side of the house. They're literally touching this building. Here's the point. What can the Justinianos do about this? Absolutely nothing. Because there is no government regulation. There is no zoning requirement to prevent the developer from doing exactly what he's doing. So that's just a reminder. You really don't like government? This is what you get. Money makes might and might makes right. We're going to take a break. And here we are back again, back again at it. Um, okay, right now we're going to go to what's become our other regular weekly feature, uh, the Clown Award. I had some choices to make this week. I was actually thinking of citing Pat Robertson uh, for the Clown Award because he blamed what he called awful looking women for the lack of romance in some marriages. Uh, I decided he was too easy a target. Then I thought about the founder of Whole Foods. His name is John Mackey. He was on NPR recently, and he said he wanted to take back what he said in 2009, which was that Obamacare was like socialism. It's not like socialism, he said. It's more like fascism. It took him one day to back off from that. He limited himself to calling it a program uh, he, he basically he was calling this program that's going to force tens of millions of people to buy health insurance on the private market as government controlled health care. But our clown award, the red nose, this week goes to a team. It's a team effort. It consists of Fox News or faux news, as I like to call them, one unnamed parent and the administration of Delavan Darien, Darien High School of Delavan, Wisconsin. The school had a course called American Diversity, which according to the school's website, uh, studies American society through the connections among culture, ethnicity, race, religion, and gender issues to create a more accurate picture of modern America, which actually sounds like a pretty cool course. Now, the thing is, as part of this, the course included attention to something called critical race theory. A critical race theory includes something called white privilege. Uh, this is a set of advantages that white people enjoy that uh, non-white people don't have, the advantages they enjoy over non-white people in any typical 
economic, social, or political setting. What's important about the idea of white privilege is that this, does, this is not about racism. This is not about bigotry per se. Because the thing is, you can be not a racist, not in any way a bigot, not in any way intentionally discriminatory, and yet still benefit from white privilege without even actually knowing you have those benefits, without actually realizing it. That's what's important about this. In fact, there was this author, her name was Peggy McIntosh. He ex she expressed the idea of white privilege well in a couple of little things. She said, for example, she said, I can talk with my mouth full without having people attribute it to my color. I can be late for a meeting without people laying it to my race. In fact, uh, one time Bill O'Reilly was talking about, uh, he'd gone to, with a friend to a restaurant in Harlem. And he said he was surprised. He said he was surprised to discover this was just like an ordinary family kind of thing. There are people there with their dates, their spouses there having dinner with their children, family thing, family outing, uh, and it was just a normal normal kind of thing. He said, he said, there was nobody there shouting, hey, mf -er, where's my iced tea? And he said this surprised him. Well, right there, that expresses white privilege. If somebody in that restaurant had been shouting, hey, mf -er, where's my iced tea? He wouldn't have been surprised. He would have been like, well, that's the way they behave. Uh, if he'd been in a restaurant somewhere else with maybe it's all whites there, maybe the entire restaurant has happened at that moment to be full of white people, and one of them was going, hey, mf -er, where's my where's my iced tea? It would never occur to him to say, oh, that's because they're white. That's how white people act. That is the essence of white privilege. If you're white, you're judged as an individual. If you're not white, you're judged as a black, Hispanic, whatever. You're judged as your color or as your race. That's the essence of white privilege. Um, now, it's important to talk about white privilege because it's a bar to advancement, but it's subtle. Again, you can be completely not racist and still benefit from white privilege. So it's, it's often, it's less visible. And for that reason, it's more important to pay, it is important to pay attention to it. But apparently, not anymore at Delavan Darien High School of Delavan, Wisconsin. Because Anne, and I emphasize that word because it was that way in all of the uh, news coverage, because of an unnamed parent, uh, this parent claimed that this was indoctrination. They're teaching white guilt. They're dividing the students, saying to non-whites, you've been oppressed and you're still being oppressed. Which of course is true, even in schools. In fact, according to a 2012 survey done by, of 72,000 U.S. schools done by the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, minority students across America face harsher discipline, have less, less access to rigorous uh, high school curricula, and are more often taught by lower paid and less experienced teachers. But all that information, of course, you know, that, that fact, of course, is it's, it's irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. It is irrelevant when a disgruntled clown of a parent who doesn't have the guts to be named but does have the wits to run to Fox News with this whine about the liberal indoctrination so that that cacophony of clownishness can cluck and caterwaul and so have that clown of a school superintendent whose name is Robert Christ bloviate about how, well, there is some merit to parental concern and how a lot of red flags went up in his, he insisted it was his mind when he looked at the materials. So the course is not going to be offered at the school again until after the district evaluates the curricula. Because of one, count it, one, person who did not want their precious child being exposed to the real world. That parent, along with Superintendent Robert Christ and, of course, Fox News, you are all clowns. All right, last thing for the rest of the show. <clears throat> We're going to talk about guns. Now, um, I, 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 you know, the thing is, 
part of the reason is that it happened again. Even as I was putting together the notes for today's show, it happened again. There was a shooting at uh, Lone Star College, which is a campus outside Houston, Texas. Two people got into an argument, guns were pulled, three people were shot. Happily, none of them were killed. Uh, now, this, this actually, this would not be considered a, a mass shooting because it only involved three people and nobody died. But there was a mass shooting. There was a mass shooting last weekend. According to the arrest report involved on Saturday, January 19th, a 15-year-old boy shot and killed both of his parents and his three younger siblings, aged 9, 5, and 2. They, this happened at the family home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The accused, whose name is Nehemiah Grigo, had never been in t uh, trouble with the law. He had had no contact with juvenile justice before this. There was no record of any recent emergency calls to the house. Each victim, each of these five victims, each of these five people killed, was shot multiple times. Apparently different guns were used in the attack. Several guns were found in the house, uh, including at least one assault rifle. So we're going to talk about guns. I'd rather be talking about other things, to tell you the truth. I would like to be talking about um, with the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, for example. I'd like to be talking about the legacy of Martin Luther King. I'd like to be talking about how this month, January, is the 10th anniversary of the landing on Mars of the Mars rover Spirit and Opportunity, and how after 10 years, Opportunity is still going. I'd love to be talking about how astronomers have found the, the, the largest known structure in the universe. It's a cluster of quasars that occupy so much space that it actually challenges our understandings of cosmology. On a serious note, I'd like to be talking about the economy. I'd like to be talking about why we're still talking about the deficit instead of stimulus when unemployment is still at 7.8% and, and inequality continues to rise. It's as if we're supposed to regard that first figure as so good and the second as so normal that we don't need to bother with them anymore. I'd like to be talking about how the Obama administration continues to persecute whistleblowers like John Kiriakou and Bradley Manning. And even more, how it's, it's fighting to keep secret its claimed legal justification for ordering the murder of, of Americans abroad without trial. But well, we're going to talk about guns. In fact, I expect I'll be talking something about guns, about some aspect of this, every week for the next few weeks anyway. A good starting point for us here is Obama's proposals. Obama's proposals on gun control. Uh, among the major ones were requiring criminal background checks for all gun sales, reinstating the assault weapons ban, restoring a 10-round limit on, on uh, um, ammunition magazines, eliminating armor-piercing bullets, providing mental health services in schools, allocating more funds for police, and instituting a federal gun trafficking law, among others. He also was issuing 23 executive orders, most of which are about collecting and organizing information within the executive branch. So no, uh, despite the fevered fantasies of the fanatics, this is not a power grab. This is not an end run about Congress or the Constitution. This is administrative matters within the executive branch. Now, on the whole, Obama's proposals are good ones. In fact, Rachel Maddow actually expressed it well. She said he hasn't gone further than other presidents, but he's gone wider. He's been more inclusive. So they're, on the whole, they're good. The problem is they are inadequate to the tasks to which they are set. I'm going to talk today about two ways that they're inadequate. One is that the administration and loads of other people are acting as if the single most important issue is getting guns out of the hands of crazy people. That is a misguided, useless, feel-good deal that does more to make us feel we're doing something than to actually accomplish anything. Because mentally ill people are no more likely to commit acts of violence than normal people. There is no evidence that the mentally ill possess or use guns any more than normal people. In fact, the best available data indicates that no more than about 4% of the violence in the United States can be ascribed to mental illness, which means if we eliminated every act of violence by every mentally ill person, we'd still have violence at 96% of the levels we have it now. What's more, laws that require professionals to report anybody they think 
might commit an act of violence, is more likely to result in false positives and people being unnecessarily and voluntarily committed to mental institutions than it is to actually prevent violence. Even experienced people with specialized training have trouble predicting who is going to actually act in a violent fashion. What these laws, frankly, are more likely to do is to discourage people from seeking treatment. Now, admittedly, it's reasonable to think that if um, you're uh, going to go shoot up a, a, a campus or a school or a movie theater, that you probably have some mental problems. We know Adam Lanza did. We know that Sung Hai Cho, who was the shooter at, at Virginia Tech, we know he did. But do we really want to adopt a policy that will make such people less likely to seek treatment? But here, here, here is the real thing. What if all these proposals pass? What if every one of them passes? What would be the result? Well, it would be a good one. Fewer people would die. Uh, fewer people who shouldn't have guns would have them. And fewer guns that people shouldn't have will be there to be had. But how many lives will be saved? Suppose there was never again a mass shooting in the United States. Never again, any. We would save dozens, hundreds of lives a year. And that's good. But in 2010, nearly 11,000 people were killed by guns in the United States. That's 30 people a day. That's more than a new town a day every day. And these are, remember, this is just murders. This is not suicides. This is not accidents. Add them, it's over 31,000. This is a graph that shows rates of gun ownership and handgun deaths for eight members of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Gun ownership in blue, the handgun death rate is in light purple. Notice us. Notice us at the end. We are an outlier, both in rates of violence and in rates of gun ownership. On December 21st, liberal pundit Mark Shields said that since Robert Kennedy was assassinated in June of 1968, more Americans have died from gunfire than died in all of the wars of all of our history. And you know what? That's right. All of the wars in all of our history, from the revolution up to and including Afghanistan and Iraq, 1.2 million, just about. Number killed by guns in the United, uh, who died as a result of guns in the United States since 1968, 1.4 million. The homicide rate in the United States is seven times the average of all the other high income countries because our gun rate, our, our gun crime rate is 22 times that average. We are a uniquely violent nation. And until that question is addressed, until we stop talking about the, the drama of death, but the steady daily drumbeat of death, we will not have solved that problem. And you members of Congress and all you members of state legislators, I say to you again, until you deal with that, there is blood on your hands. And that, again, I'm done. I will see you next week. Have the best week you can.